Good morning. Welcome to Social Media Magic. I'm your host, Professor Bradford Knights from Westfield State University. I'm a PhD in Strategic Management and Chair of the Department of Economics and Management at Westfield State. I started a, a bicycle company many years ago, and I traveled to Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union and taught classes in international business and entrepreneurship. Uh, advising the Russians about how to start a new business, which is a very novel idea for them. I'm joined in the presentation by Elizabeth Long Lingo. Hello, my name is Elizabeth, and I am an embedded practitioner in entrepreneurship, creative leadership, and social innovation at Mount Holyoke. And um, I'm a UMass Eisenberg undergraduate alum. Um, and have wound my path where um, I ended up getting my PhD um, in organizational design and negotiation and innovation. And so prior coming to Mount Holyoke, I had this amazing opportunity to kind of design and launch programs around creativity and innovation for the public good at Vanderbilt University down in um, Nashville, Tennessee. So I have about 20 years of working um, in finance, in customer loyalty and trust, and then in the leadership of um, this core challenge, right, of entrepreneurs of working all the way from idea stage through to implementation. So and I'll, I'll be speaking on um, crowdsourcing today. Good morning, guys. How's everyone? Good. Um, I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about a firm that I run that's aimed at inspiring, igniting, and informing entrepreneurs. Folks who are at your stage of learning and knowledge because I felt like I really wished I had that when I was your age and when I was back just starting out. Um, I have 25 years of communications marketing experience in the social change segment. So I've worked with businesses that always wanted to do good in the world, those cliche green businesses. A lot of brands in the aisles of Whole Foods, a lot of folks in the apparel, electronics, beauty, um, all kinds of segments, uh, really using social media as a social change tool. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I am also a former UMasser. I studied journalism there. And as I got to the end of my uh, undergraduate career, I said to myself, boy, I really don't want to be a journalist. Um, but what I got out of that education was great, that was fantastic and serves me every day, was just a love of storytelling and a lot of education on how to tell stories. It'll be a theme that it comes up again and again in this presentation because that's really the power of marketing can be uh, best captured through storytelling. So uh, my before I got my current position, I was actually working on the consulting side. So I worked with the financial services industry, uh, worked with a lot of folks from Mass Mutual, helping them establish their brand and their identity and how they wanted to be known and present themselves to the world around them, to their customers and their prospects. So uh, it was a great opportunity to, again, hone that storytelling, work with a bunch of different people on, on different angles, you might think, oh, well, they all must have the same story, they're financial advisors. But what's really fun and exciting about that was, was digging down in and finding the reasons why. Um, so that led to my current position today, which I will talk to you a little bit more about later. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how to make a social media strategy. We're in a, a world of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Yelp, uh, and, and many others. It's as though your business is a ship. You can picture a four-masted schooner sailing in a, in a turbulent sea of social media that's changing all the time. Uh, what I'm developing here is actually a, a cybernetics model. Cybernetics is the study of communication and control in the animal and the machine. And it comes from a Greek word meaning steerman, steersmanship, steering the ship. So this is the ship of your business. Uh, you are converting inputs into outputs for your customer. Information about this system is the basis for your perceptions of the world. So this is the world, uh, this is the, the world, this is your perception of the world, it's the reality, and that's in contrast to your dream of what the world could be like. 
uh, for your customer, for your families, for the future. The differences between the way the world is without your product or service and the way it would be if your business were successful, those differences are problems to be solved partly by your social media strategy. You choose among different social media, different content that you could put in the social media, different schedule of revising the content, different patterns of engagement with your customers. Those are decisions you'll make. You'll convert those into detailed action plans to implement in your business, changing the, your relationship with your customers through social media, changing the relationship between the inputs and the outputs, and improving the products and services for the benefit of the customer to change the world from the way it was to the way it will be. Uh, we can skip the next two slides because that's what I just said. And then we have from a colleague at Westfield State, Professor Phil Hart, 10 tips for social media marketing. Nothing's free. If you remember the, the diagram, there are inputs to your business and those are costly, including managing your social media. So you have to design a strategy that uh, doesn't cost too much. Next, the big, the big four types of social media, your major decision is among those, as I said, but as we'll see in the succeeding presentations, there are, of course, many other social media, and social media are evolving continually. Uh, third tip, content is king. Followers come for the content, and a theme we'll see in the presentations to come are that part of that content is the story that you tell. Uh, you want your, your customers and the people who join you in the social media to be able to see your image of the world. The story is about your image of the world and the world that, that could be. So the importance of content. The 80-20 rule says that 20% of your content is, is likely to be original and 80% is going to be shared or imported from other sources. Tip five, keep the update times down. Don't take too long in updating your content. Uh, next slide. Uh, don't update it too frequently because then when your uh, customers and when you're, the, the people you join with in the social media, when they come back to check in, they'll feel like they've missed a lot and they'll turn off. Slow and steady wins. It takes time to build a social media presence. Uh, it's the product life cycle. It's the learning curve that you will have seen in marketing classes. It's true for any product or service. There's a learning curve for your story and your social media. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Maintain an, an interaction. Again, it's about the pace of engagement. That's something that you need to tune the same way you do driving a car in traffic. In fact, um, the social media is the environment that we have now. We used to have an environment of oceans with ships, of uh, railroad transportation, we had an environment of trucks and cars, now we live in a world of, of social media. Put out the fires, address negativity. You can, you've seen people get, can get vicious in social media for the same reason that people uh, become, develop road rage. They may be powerless in their lives, suddenly they have power, anonymity, and uh, they can express themselves and it's unfortunate but you need to deal with that quickly so that it doesn't dominate. And finally, search engine optimization, improve your presence in search results and now we'll see some vivid stories and, and examples of social media and first we'll visit. Hello, so how many people have heard of crowdfunding? Great, so I'm so pleased to hear that. So I was a finance undergrad, and I have worked um, you know, with entrepreneurs and business people for 20 years, and for so long, we had the options in terms of funding. We had our own, the money in our own pocket, right? the money from our parents. If we were lucky, we could get a, lending, a loan from a bank. We could get some money from the VCs. In recent times, we've suddenly had this incredible unleashing of the ability to get, garner financing and funding for our ideas through crowdsourcing. Anyone here a Kickstarter? Right, so this did not exist um, in recent times. And suddenly, um, we have this amazing opportunity for, um, for entrepreneurs. 
um, to tell their stories, to reach a much larger number of people in a compelling way, um, to think about how to get rapid feedback from a much larger array of um, potential consumers, investors, to get a proof of concept much earlier on. So I want to focus on um, crowdsourcing too because I think it also, as, as I teach entrepreneurship, the idea of developing a crowdsourcing campaign tests you on so many different levels and stretches your capacity. So you need to be able to pitch your idea, but also using visual media, right? So we need to be able to use video, we need to use images, we need to be able to tell our narrative. We need to be able to think of what exactly do these people want out of it? Do they want invest equity? Do they want a reward? Do they want this sense of, I'm part of this larger tribe that's supporting this project? And also, as an entrepreneur, it helps us to think about how do we engage our audiences, our funders, our stakeholders in a much deeper way, perhaps inviting them into the creative process itself. So as we see, Kickstarter, um, primarily for creative projects, but if you go on Kickstarter, you can see um, hundreds of thousands of creative projects and ventures that are out there looking for funding. Everything from a film, documentary, to new restaurants, to new bookstores, um, funding of novels, funding of um, craft exchanges. If you want inspiration for ideas, this is a great place to go. If you want money for your projects, again, this is an incredible source um, for you. Indiegogo, this is interesting, I just, as I was doing the research for this presentation, Crowdfunder, there's now this bubbling up of all these brokers who are trying to actually be the mediators for you to get your ideas out and tap you into the, the realm of crowdsourcing. Kiva, anyone heard of Kiva? Yeah, so Kiva is incredibly powerful. It's a way of doing micro-lending. Um, in all of crowdsourcing, people can invest anything from a dollar to $500,000. So it's an amazing way to reach a whole array of people at different levels. Um, what's intriguing to me about crowdsourcing as well is the range of projects that you can invest in and be a part of. And I really mean be a part of. As an investor in these projects, you just feel, I, I've invested in a, in a chocolate company in Seattle. I live in Massachusetts. That's pretty amazing. So they, I uh, funded a uh, circuit bender ball, bar, um, ball where they brought together people around technology and electronics um, and a new way to, to, to launch those projects. I funded something called the Kite Patch. This is an amazing little patch that they're developing um, that repels mosquitoes. So they're trying to, to develop this patch, especially in Africa, to deal with malaria. And I want to just point out, the original goal for this Kite Patch campaign was $75,000. They raised $557,000 through crowdsourcing. So this is a serious, there's billions of dollars now being <coughs> exchanged to these crowdsourcing sites. You can also fund, this is an interesting, this pool tile by tile project. This is a group of three entrepreneurs they want to create a floatable swimming pool in the East River of Manhattan. And they're engaging people in their story and they're saying, look, imagine what's possible. Imagine swimming in the East River and you can have a tile in that swimming pool. And you can get in on these early stages of, of that entrepreneurial dream. Um, has anyone heard of the tile? It's this little tiny disc, kind of like a guitar pick. Uh, my husband's a songwriter. They went on, they were trying to get supplemental funding to money that they, they raised in Silicon Valley. So they had gotten $200,000 um, from venture capital in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. They won another $20,000. They raised $2.6 million versus an alternative, another uh, crowdsourcing platform called Self Starter. So as we're thinking about actually taking our ideas and making it happen, I just want everyone to be aware of this. So it's social media, this is where it's all coming together, right? We're marketing our messages, we're developing our pitch, we're engaging and thinking about how to, um, how to really create connection with funders, with stakeholders, with bloggers, with, um, with um, our consumers. So for sake of time, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of different models that are out there. Um, three, there's three of them now, which is, um, I just wanna point out. So the first is probably the ones that you've heard of, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. 
And the idea is that someone's out there, they create their pitch um, with these particular, um, in Kickstarter, for example, you think about different reward structures and different ways and levels at which people can engage your project. Might be a $1, might be a 10, might be a 50, might be a 300. And you think about different reward levels based on what people are investing. <clears throat> or it might just be a donation model, so there's no reward. And that's been kind of the dominant model, 71%. Um, the second is a lending model, and again, that's the Kiva model, right? This micro-lending, crowdsourced lending, where you have your idea, you crowdsource, people can fund at the $5 level. But the key is, is that you're actually repaying a loan. So people are crowdsourcing a loan, and then you're actually paying it back. Um, on the Kiva website, if you look, 99% repayment rate. The third is equity. And this is something new for the US. So in 2012, there's a whole history here that I won't go into. Go look it up. Equity, raising equity through crowdsourcing is now possible, um, just since 2012. And through the Obama administration, through the Title II, and then also through the, <clears throat> the job acts that's supporting entrepreneurs, this became possible. So now you'll see, if you start going out there, you can see, um, remember on that one of those first slides about that crowdfunder? There are now platforms, um, venture capitalists, equity brokers who are trying to help navigate that platform, be the broker between all these entrepreneurs and the crowdfunders. Okay, so crowdfunding, secrets of success. So, um, so I have this amazing opportunity at Vanderbilt to, and I am so passionate about helping students how to design and launch creative enterprise. So I thought, wow, I need to have all of my students actually do a Kickstarter with me. So for one of my classes, we worked with an African-American novelist um, named Alice Randall, and she was really interested in taking a novel approach to tackling African-American diabetes. So instead of just having doctors say, you need to get better, she said, I'm going to write a book. Um, and her book was very successful, but we wanted to get raised funds to get those books out to African-American churches and beauty salons throughout the diabetes and stroke belt um, to start fostering conversation about behavioral change and cultural norms. So, anyway, so and this was because we were at Vanderbilt as in a program around creativity and innovation for the public good. So one of the first things we had to do was think about what should our target goal be? And this is one of the things you need to be thoughtful about. So what is the actual amount that you can ask for? Um, and different models will afford you different kind of latitude in terms of how high you set that bar. In Kickstarter, what's really interesting is that you are only funded if you're fully funded. So you don't want to go too high, or else you know, you're not going to get any money at all unless you hit your target. So we went for $3,000, and we ended up kind of getting about that, $3,500. Okay, so secrets to success. Develop your visual storytelling chops. This is going to come out again and again. Social media and the power is the storytelling by using visuals and thinking about the aesthetics and how do you get that story across and create that connection um, through video when you're not face to face with the person. The second is getting your goals, as I said, you know, kind of that target amount, right? What's a reasonable pitch? What's a reasonable ask to the crowd? Um, and then your rewards, right, as well. And this is kind of just basic 101, right, for all entrepreneurs. You need to think about how are you going to incentivize those people to actually invest in, in your effort? <clears throat> this was key for our success. <laughs> Take an integrated approach, online, offline, right? So we had market, you know, we had Facebook campaigns, we had Twitter campaigns, we had Vanderbilt University was blogging about us, fantastic. But actually, what we found to be most successful was we actually had events. And we, did, we actually complemented our viral marketing with different events and different um, kind of face-to-face -face interactions that made this really successful. Um, identify your tipping point. So in crowdsourcing, you typically have a finite time to run your campaigns. It's excellent because it forces you to really think about that strategic marketing, that integrated approach, and how you're going to run that for that 30-day or 60-day session. So in Kickstarter, they recommend 30 days. So you have 30 days to reach your goal. And what they have found is that if you, there's a kind of a tipping point. So by kind of day 10 or day 20, 
or day 15, sorry, 10 or 15, you have to be at least halfway funded or else it's not going to be successful. So you kind of have to get that ramping up early. How will you do that? How will you get people committed so that you can kind of show and kind of the proof of concept um, to the crowd? One of the things about Kickstarter and these crowdsourcing platforms is you need to be clear about your risks. So there's a whole section about what are the risks? How could this not work? So these platforms work because there's tr kind of this trust, right, in the platform that you're going to clearly articulate what your risks are, the potential that you might fail, what the problems might be um, to your investors. And finally, fulfill your promises. Um, this follow through piece is so critical. So if you say that you're going to do kind of behind the scenes um, video sharing your, you know, your creative process, the entrepreneurial process, the day that you're shipping, right? You're finally shipping your goods and you had promised that you're going to have a video of that. You better do that because that's how you stay engaged to keep your people committed. Um, and that follow through piece is really what um, distinguishes the successful entrepreneur. So I'm now going to pass it over. So, hello again, guys. Um, as I said, I work for a company called Prosperity Candle. So Prosperity Candle is a startup social enterprise working with former uh, women refugees who are resettling here in the Pioneer Valley and rebuilding their lives. Every candle that we sell is hand poured by a woman artisan. Every candle comes with her portrait, signature, and story, um, which enables the consumer to connect with the creator. And every candle we sell helps provide living wage work for a marginalized community that may not have these opportunities elsewhere. Uh, so that's a little about what we do. When I joined the company, which was in the fall of 2012, we already had a pretty robust social media presence. We were on, uh, I think, five or so different platforms. Uh, today, we have a presence on six different platforms. Uh, I am typically a one-woman marketing department, so uh, as, as has been covered earlier in the presentation, uh, you really do have to be strategic about where you spend your time. One of the great things about social media and about entrepreneurship is the flexibility. Something that works for you at one time in your company's career may turn out to be a less valuable platform as other ones crop up or as your focus or strategy changes. And it's very easy to flow from one platform to another as your needs, market, and the available media evolves. So in the interest of time, um, what I'd like to do is look outside of you know, the big four, um, the big guys, uh, get away from talking about something like Twitter or Facebook, and focus on some of the new newcomers, relative newcomers, to the social media landscape. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about two companies that were launched in 2010 and are now very much major players, especially for uh, consumer brands, folks in e-commerce. Uh, those would be Instagram and Pinterest. So we joined Instagram very recently, just this past August. And uh, as I was putting this presentation together, I was trying to put myself in, uh, in your seats, and my immediate question would be, well, wait a minute, if you're a very lean team, why would you start yet another social media platform? Which would be a good question. And the reason that we decided to start using Instagram uh, is that it really felt like a necessary move for us. We were seeing diminishing returns on platforms like Facebook. Um, I don't know if you're following kind of how that's evolving for businesses, but Facebook is moving more and more towards grabbing revenue off of brands and pages, and your organic posts are going to less and less of your audience. I think an organic post reaches about 6% of your Facebook audience at this point. So unless you have a lot of money to put behind it, or unless you're a wizard at writing really viral posts that get a ton of engagement on Facebook, you may find that you're getting less out of it, which is what we were seeing. We had also just undergone a rebrand this summer. And part of that rebrand uh, was in involved in investment in a portfolio of beautiful visuals that we've never had before. We really invested in making sure we had excellent photography to help with, as Elizabeth said, that visual storytelling aspect. So images of what it looks like when hot wax is flowing out of a pitcher into a vessel. 
uh, beautiful lifestyle kind of magazine editorial type photography showing our candles in use in people's homes to kind of have that aspirational, oh, I can see how this piece would fit into my life, that angle. And having this robust portfolio, which was very exciting for me, it felt like a wealth of riches, um, it made sense to switch our focus to some platforms that really revolve around visuals and rely entirely on them. So I've really found, and I think some interesting things to think about where Instagram can add value, I found that it's a very effective tool for building relationships with bloggers and other influencers. Uh, press is incredibly valuable as a, as a startup, and it's a great place to foster relationships. It doesn't take a ton of effort, and it can help warm up those relationships before you reach out to a reporter or a blogger um, so that they're a little aware of what you are before you make that hard pitch for coverage. It's also a really effective tool for reaching uh, my company's secondary target market, which is socially conscious millennials. Uh, Instagram is heavily, heavily used by younger folks, um, so great access point there. And it's also a good place for us to work on building uh, relationships with other brands. One thing that you want to think about uh, is that we're all in a very crowded marketplace uh, when you're looking at e-commerce or just kind of building your presence on the internet in general. Everyone's out there, everyone has a voice, and getting above the noise is your biggest challenge a lot of the time. So what I uh, like to think about and what a lot of people in this mission-oriented space is, how can I find alliances, um, whether they be nonprofit, other companies, that we're coming from a common place in our mission or our impact goals, uh, but we're not necessarily competitive with each other. And just bringing that together and uh, supplementing each other's impact outreach and tapping into each other's audiences. So, you know, I really, to, to sum up, I really think that Instagram is fantastic for busy folks. It's instant, like the name says, you can either upload a photo that you've just taken that day or one that you have available. There's not a ton of content. It's short form in terms of captions. Engagement with others is very short form. It can be done a minute at a time throughout your day without taking away too much energy from anything else. And I also think it's a great tool for letting your customers come behind the scenes. So, you know, one day we had uh, some packaging labels show up in the office and we were really psyched about them. So we said, you know, let's just take a quick photo and say, hey, these labels showed up. And uh, it's, it's, it's a nice thing to do because it takes away some of the gloss and the veneer of all of that high impact photography and lets people see that there are real people behind the scenes as well. It gives an insight into the day to day. And the second platform that I want to talk about, as I said, is Pinterest. So in a very short time, Pinterest has become a major player in social media. It is today the third most popular social media network, eclipsed only by Facebook and Twitter. And uh, for Prosperity Candle, it makes perfect sense for us to be on Pinterest. Um, to give you a couple of stats that you might already know or may not, 80% of users on Pinterest are women. We're a company that sells candles primarily to women. Our target market is there. Pinterest also accounts for 25% of retail referral traffic. That is a huge number. And Pinterest generates four times more revenue per click than Twitter, and 27% more revenue per click than Facebook. So, you know, another way to look at that is, sure, Facebook and Twitter may be more popular overall than Pinterest, but if I have to kind of choose where I'm gonna spend my time, my ROI might be better by focusing on Pinterest. And so to speak a little bit about why we find Pinterest to be an effective tool, I really think it's a great place to show and illustrate who your target customer is and let her look at your presence on Pinterest and self-identify. They know me, they're interested in what I'm interested in. Um, so just to give a, a quick example of how that works for, for my company, we're, we're all about ethically made goods, we're about um, living wages, we're about fair trade. Our target customer is concerned about making sure that her products are doing good in the world and not harm. She's likely into organic, she shops at Whole Foods, she shops at farmers markets. Um, she likely enjoys buying things where there's a story. She knows where it came from. She knows that people 
weren't harmed. She knows that people were paid well for their work, um, and she values that. So obviously, you know, thinking about that 80-20 rule of not just talking about yourself all the time, Pinterest is a great way for me to introduce her to other ethical brands. She's probably interested <coughs> in jewelry that comes from all around the world that's hard to need and fair trade and provides living wage income. She's probably interested in home decor items. So uh, we can make some guesses about what's going to resonate with her and, again, let her do that self-identification and grow that relationship. And finally, I wanted to, before I finish up, talk a little bit about growing your social networks and your audience and your tribe in general. One thing that I found is that there's a lot of marketing advice out there on growing your list and growing your audience and all of that. But a lot of times, I, I've found that it tends to be very B2B focused. A lot of talk around um, white papers and ebooks and positioning yourself as a thought leader, which if you're interested in going into um, e-commerce or launching a product, service, or a consumer <coughs> brand, it might not make as much sense for you. Uh, so in addition to all of the organic growth and, and building your content and all of that, one tool I found that can give you a little bit of a jump start is Rafflecopter, which is a giveaway widget. Now, everyone likes something free. It's a really pretty simple there. Um, but you have to be strategic with the way that you do this. It's not going to be a solid strategy to just always be giving away free product. You're devaluing your giveaways, and there's going to be definitely a law of diminishing returns that comes in. Uh, however, if you are approaching a new selling season, so for example, for us, Mother's Day is a big selling season for us. So maybe in March or April, I'll run a giveaway uh, to bring some more people into that marketing funnel as we then get ready to enter a harder selling season where the push will be, hey, you're here, now buy your mom a candle. Um, we're also doing a giveaway right now. The reason we're doing that, A, we're approaching a major selling season again with the holidays coming up, and B, we are launching a new line of products. So great time to supplement all of the outreach that we're doing, all of the other social media network uh, usage that we're doing is giving away one of our new products, which is called the Forever Candle. And my goal with doing a giveaway is always to grow my mailing list. So you have so much flexibility on Rafflecopter to think about what your strategic goals are, what, your, what growth to which platforms you're trying to drive, and to set your give, giveaway accordingly. So my mandatory entry, you have to join our mailing list. But beyond that, people have the ability to earn additional entries by connecting with us on various social media platforms. And it can be as simple as someone clicking like and they're following you on Facebook or Pinterest, or you can do a little bit of content seeding uh, with these giveaways. So a couple of things that we're doing along that is we have a pin this image on Pinterest option. So if someone wants, they can pin one of the images that we invested in over the summer uh, to their boards, which helps reach all of their audiences and put a picture of Prosperity Candles products right in their feeds. And we also have an option that, the, uh, that can be optionally done tweeting about the giveaway, uh, which again, putting it in their feed, potentially reaching their followers who may click that link, join the giveaway, and hopefully tweet about it to their followers, so on and so forth. Uh, so when you get home today, prosperitycandle.com slash win forever. <laughs> Thanks for your time, guys. We are looking forward to chatting. How's everybody? Good. It's going well, you're learning a lot, having fun. Let me see a show of hands of uh, who has no idea what they want to be when they grow up. What I want to chat with you about in the next few minutes is uh, the agency that I run here based in the Pioneer Valley called True to You. It's about being, understanding who you are and leveraging that passion, that personal brand to turn it into whether it's a business that you run, start, or operate, or own, or whether you work in any other organization for another person, whether you work in a company, in a nonprofit, in a government agency. Your success in a large part, it certainly in my experience is about igniting that fire that you have inside you and creating that personal brand. I um, sometimes think of myself as a reinvention coach, right? I've had a lot of epiphanies in my life. My family members, my friends, my colleagues always say, 
I can't keep up with you. You're always starting new businesses. You're going on to other things. You're leaving different segments. But if I actually follow the trajectory of when I was in high school all the way to this moment, I feel like I've been doing the same thing my whole life. And if I were to say, well, what's my personal brand? I think of myself as kind of a pathological optimist. I'm interested in a lot of things, but the core things that I really want to spend my time doing, I've actually turned into great business opportunities. So I've been in business um, in communications, public relations, marketing, and branding for 25 years. I have, can you go to the next slide? Worked for um, some of the biggest brands in social change and cause marketing. Anyone here heard of Patagonia, Whole Foods, Aveda, Ben & Jerry, Stonyfield Farm? Those are all brands that I've worked for either as their vice president of communications and marketing or externally where I've run my own communications agency to really deal with their communications and PR needs. The woven thread through all of that pathological optimism for me and what I care about is using the power of communications to do good in the world. Sounds terribly cliche, but I'm actually interested in a lot of things. I'm interested in how to, how to really fight causes and raise awareness and drive people into action based on what an organization or company is doing. So I've had the opportunity inside all of these brands on working on those issues. Organic agriculture, sustainable fisheries, climate, travel philanthropy, green businesses, supply chains, fair trade, social entrepreneurship. And I've actually come full circle back to social entrepreneurship because in 2008, I quit my job. I had this great gig. This is right before the bottom of the world fell out, by the way. Um, and so many people have said, boy, remind me not to have you buy a lottery ticket for me next time. <laughs> but the point is, I had really done all I could do working for a great brand by the name of Lindblad Expeditions. They were sort of the leader of ecotourism. Small ship cruises all over the world, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the Galapagos Islands, Baja, California. I got to bring my film crews and, and really tell incredible stories working with National Geographic explorers and entrepreneurs on board our ships. It was a great gig. 33 trips around the world in less than five years. But I really wanted to find work in the Pioneer Valley, right here, right where we live. And there I was in Amherst with all the students from the five colleges, and everybody said, MJ, I want you to help me figure out what you did. You seem to have this like, really cool career working with all these cool companies doing good in the world. But actually, they didn't know what that piece inside of them was to turn on. And so that's where the true to you name of the communications firm comes from. Being true to yourself and using the power of that truth to really ignite your own business and figure out what you want to do. Next slide. So I'm going to give you four case studies of how to use social marketing in a variety of either your own business that you're starting now, I assume, let me see a show of hands of who has a business idea or who's an entrepreneur or who wants to start something in this room. Okay, and who is looking to use their own critical skills, tools, interests to work for somebody else when they get out of here? Okay. So it's a good mix. You can do either with these four case studies that I'm going to show you. The good news is that social networking is like the best thing that ever came along to help you do that for very little money. And when I started out and I had my first jobs in PR and marketing, and then when I ran my own firm, these tools didn't exist. So here's four quick ways that you can really use social networking. The first one is one of my clients it's called Goodweave. Goodweave is a little tiny nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that rescues and rehabilitates child laborers in the high-end carpet industry. Not something you think about every day, right? Turns out, in 1997, there were about a million kids in India and Nepal working in child labor making high-end rugs, tying little knots. Also turns out that it takes about a million knots to tie an 8 by 10 rug for a child laborer of 8, 9, 10 years old. This NGO rescues, rehabilitates, sends them to school by virtue of people buying a rug that has the good weed label on it. 
we came up with an ad campaign called One in a Million, playing both off of the million kids and the million nots. And that campaign we put on all social networking platforms and drove enough interest such that Macy's decided they wanted to sell those rugs. So a really easy, good way. And the nonprofit said, but MJ, we don't have a big budget. We don't really have anything except this one thing. We have these incredible shots. As Kim mentioned, when you have really good assets of photography, they happen to have photos of these child laborers from Roberto Romano, a very famous Italian photographer that we use as center to the ads. So 11 magazines picked up the ads as pro bono and virally on all of the apps through mostly Facebook and Twitter at the time, really drove interest around buying good weave rugs to support um, fighting child labor. So for social change and impact, it's a great tool. Next slide. Another great opportunity, and again, these are tiny budget examples. There were a bunch of companies interested in leveraging their interest around climate change. And we came up with a campaign called undoit.org. And we said to all of them, we're happy to build your brand's profile into the campaign. So we came up with ads, and this is hard to see from the back of the room, but Gary Erickson at Cliff Bar, his, his brand is really about extreme sports. So he wanted to showcase extreme sports. Whereas Stonyfield was leveraging a lot of their focus in marketing around youth soccer and health and wellness and moms and organic. And Organic Valley was really focused on the purity of organic and babies. So all of our headlines were, there's things you can't undo. Climate change and global warming isn't one of them. We also did another ad with Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl, if you remember. There's some things you can't undo. Global warming's not one of them. Um, we had another one with a <coughs> toilet bowl, and you're in a hotel, and the toothbrush drops into the toilet bowl. There's some things you can't undo. Uh, climate change isn't one of them. And what that did is it drove enough people to sign petitions to get the bill moved into Congress. So it was really around these companies' desire to be activists. Again, using platforms like Facebook, Twitter, um, to really move their, to move their campaign and to drive it eventually to the URL. Next slide. So you heard Elizabeth talk about crowdfunding, um, raising money, philanthropy, getting coverage in the news. These are really important things to get a new brand or initiative noticed. Another client of ours is Verite, based in Amherst. They uh, monitor sweatshops around the world. They had the Department of Labor funding a really, really big report on the number of people in sweatshops and human trafficking and enslaved conditions around the world. 14.7 million. It's not a small number. It's a really big number. And that commissioned report and the work that Verite did in uncovering what they found in these awful, awful conditions in something like 27 countries around the world, they then said, well, what do we do with that 14.7 million? And it's, by the way, in apparel and footwear and beauty and electronics and every single thing you buy and eat. But the government really wanted to know, how can we help more people understand this? So we created a video, the story of Ed, who's a Filipina girl representing that 14.7 million. And in that five little, five minute little video of Ed's story, we represented all the other folks. Again, we put it out on all the social networks. We got coverage in something like seven national outlets, a ton of international outlets, top tier news stories. But it made its way around and ended up raising a lot of money for the NGO on the backside. Again, a really inexpensive way to draw attention, to get news coverage, and to use social networking as that platform. And finally, the last slide, I, this is a client of mine, not the Dalai Lama's not a client of mine, but um, there's a client in Hadley called the Mind and Life Institute, based right here in the Pioneer Valley. And 
A couple of months ago, they hired me because they had a big conference on mindfulness and neuroscience coming together. And they wanted like 1,600 people was their break-even point, held at the Marriott Copley last weekend, four-day conference. And when I saw them in September, they said, MJ, we really were only at 1,000. We really need to get up to 1,600 for our break-even spot. And they had a huge following on on Facebook. They had something like, for mindfulness and neuroscientists, it was pretty large. 70,000 followers on Facebook. It's not, you know, it's a pretty big deal for a lot of academics. And they were not using their tools on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, um, at all. And so they had 16 some odd years of Dalai Lama intimate conversations in his living room, all sitting on the shelf. So I, my film team produced little one minute spots, 60 second spots about His Holiness really talking about um, lessening the ills of society, like helping people in their everyday lives. So they bring meditation, mindfulness together with neuroscience. We created these five little spots that were really easy to understand and in less than seven weeks we raised the numbers up to 1,700 and surpass their sort of break-even spot. So marketing-wise, think what you'd have to spend in either radio, banner ads, advertising. There's no way this organization had that, but we used the, skin, the tools, really, of social networking um, for, as a marketing platform. And it was just super, super, super successful. So. These four examples sort of, I wanted to end by telling you that I come full circle of running my last communications agency. I spoke at this conference two or three years ago, and I was just starting my own venture called uh, True to You, and it's really an apparel company. It's a project by students, for students, about underwear and dormwear that's made with integrity, with good working condition, and sold for students who are entrepreneurs. And it's interesting that that catalyzed time that I was here, we're now getting ready to ramp up and start that company, and our samples are being made as we speak in Turkey. But the point of why my agency was really started by four and by students sitting in chairs just like you is that a lot of times students who work for us say, God, I have no idea what I want to do, MJ, and I just, I'm really interested in all these kinds of things, but I don't know what to do next. And the key thing for moving to the next step is figure out what that personal brand is of yours. Figure out what you're really interested in. And no matter what that is, you'll be able to figure it out, whether it's your own business or whether it's a company or an organization in which you work. Thanks very much. So I think a surprising theme that came out of the presentations was that you don't have to give up your dreams in order to have a successful business uh, the way people once thought you needed to. So let's open it up for questions right away for our panel. Um, hi, Jonathan Nagasaka from Western New England University. My question to, I guess, the panel is how do you commercialize, say, research? I have, for some people, they want to go into graduate school, possibly pursue a PhD. How do you commercialize, say, a, a medical research? So in commercialize, you mean make it, like take it and take your research and create a market for it? Is that what you mean? Do you mean raise money for your research? Uh, no, like commercializing it. Um, so it's really sell it. Sell it, yes. And do you have a sense of what a product would be or is it a patent? Is your idea that you, you have some insight and you want to be able to pitch it to companies that might be able to commercialize it? Um, wait, can you rephrase the question? Well, I think one of the yeah, questions is... Really that's the answer. Right, I mean, I think one of the questions is, is trying to figure out if you have this insight from your research. What it sounds like you're trying to do is create a connection with someone who can commercialize it. Okay. Is that right? Yes. I mean, because that's, as, as scientists, as researchers, we're developing new ideas in the lab. We're, we're tackling kind of these basic science questions. And then the, the key is trying to figure out who the industry is interested. Um, we have a case of someone at Mount Holyoke who in a classroom, and I, this isn't kind of hard science research, but she developed something, um, kind of these wearable slippers. 
the, for, for nighttime and they use Arduino technology and the question was, well, this is a really cool idea. How do I, what do I do with this, right? How do we get it out of the university? How do we get it out of the lab? And what ended up happening was she started using kind of faculty members, kind of using forums like this to pitch and just showcase the idea. So I think what you're saying is, how do I get it out there? Um, the key is, though, in all of this social media stuff and the crowdsourcing, is, is there is this con of um, how do you make sure you ensure your intellectual property rights? Right? So you're putting it out there. You're trying to get seed funding, or you're trying to get investors, or trying to get someone to help you commercialize. How do you make sure that you have that copyright and that patent first, so that that doesn't get taken from you? Um, so I would say it's, for you, it's a combination of both kind of like networking um, and then also trying to, you know, I, I don't know if there's a site where it's a matchmaking. Like I, have, I haven't seen a crowdsourcing or crowd, you know, where you're trying to match um, ideas with potential distributors. I just don't know of it online. But that's, that's a kind of an interesting market opportunity if it, if it doesn't exist. Does anyone know of that? Well, one of the presentations mentioned, two things mentioned, one presentation mentioned, you can find your track. So who are the people who are also interested in that kind of technology? Not, and then the, the, not, the main thing that came out of a lot of it was the story. Can you tell a story about that discovery and, and that application? And then what, uh, what, what are the groups that would be interested in that story? And from them, you can build it. I mean, also, I would say, in a nutshell, with every entrepreneurial endeavor, right, whether, whether it's research or footwear or a candle, you have to ask those traditional business questions first. What is it? Who is the market? What is this product or service? You know, start with your very basic research and then insert the word research there and watch the tentacles spread out. But you really have to start with that first. Let's um, so I do marketing, I'm kind of a one person marketing team myself for a nonprofit. Um, we do Twitter, we do, um, we just started doing Google Plus. My question is, is we keep having to cancel events because we're not getting the attendance and enrollment and this is basically my job. I'm all over social media, I'm like always you know, I'm active, I have, um, we use Hootsuite, so I have everything scheduled going out. What, what, a, um, is, first of all, is Google Plus worth my time, do you think? Because we just started using that. And what else can I do to amp this up? I mean, we are, uh, we help small businesses grow, we have funding, we have grants, we can, you know, pay for people to come to our classes and our workshops, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> too. So events are very challenging. They, they just are. I, I've always found events to be challenging. You're not alone in this. Um, uh, to quickly speak to the Google Plus angle, it depends if your audience is there, to be honest. Um, it's a platform that has a lot of energy around it because it's Google's social network. Um, and I think there's a lot of thinking, Google is going to reward me for utilizing and keeping a presence on that network. What I've found is that if I present my my tribe, my consumers, with areas of social media to engage me, here, here's your menu of, of ways you can engage Prosperity Candle on social media. Google Plus is never picked. And so, so you know, I'm realizing this is not where they want to be, so I'm not going to force them to be there, and I'm not going to try to get them to a, adopt a new platform, and then B, engage with me on the platform. That's a really big ask. Really, I'm like, no, 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 no. Right, right. So, so that would be what I would push back if you've got someone who's like, no, Google Plus is great. It's great if your people are there. If they're not, then you know, switch your focus, find them, and then you've, oh, you've got a single ask, which is engage with me on this platform, not adopt this platform and engage with me. Um, so that would be my advice on that front. Uh, and then uh, in terms of marketing events again i think if there is if you're finding that you're struggling with this and maybe it would be helpful to hear a little bit more about what events you're running what partners can you bring in in the community or where are there opportunities to have a class or a session or event um, where there's a bigger presence so for example um, our company is located in the eastworks building in east hampton and 
if there's a big event going on on the first floor, like a, a fair or something like that, tapping into that natural energy and having that co-marketing partner there is a lot easier than just doing it on your own. So yeah, we thinking were, about- We work with a small business association store. We're all in a building together. Okay. So like, we all work together, but it's still, we're all having problems drumming people up to get into our thing. So one of the things that I would just encourage all of us to think about as we use social media or trying to think about how to engage our consumers or our audiences or whatever stakeholder is try to think about it from there. Like there's this idea of user-centered design and think about these events from the user's perspective. And maybe you need to do some focus groups with them. Why, why aren't they coming? Do you need to go out, if everyone is clustered in one building, do you need to actually go out to where your people are, the people you're trying to serve? And maybe you have it in a cafeteria. Maybe you have it you know, at a, you know, somewhere. Maybe you have it um, you know, in a non-routine place so that you're taking away that pain point of whatever it is, of what's preventing people so you're, the thing that you're saying, you're, you're, you're focusing on the push, like how do we get it out there better? But I would say step back a moment and say, what do our users want? You know, do they want these events? How do they want these events? What's the nature of them? Do they need to have food with it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> students, all food is up, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I think that like know, know your customer um, would be the first kind of prior question. Uh, I was wondering if you guys could address uh, uh, negative feedback in social media and uh, how you learn from it and how you go forward from that. You know, I, I'm of two minds. On the one hand, I'm not about censorship, right? This is all about free speech. And I'm also, I work with companies that are about transparency. And what, there is a thought that when you have great content and great transparency and you're an authentic voice in the world, that it will pay itself back in spades. But there are some awful trolls out there. I mean, let's face it. People like to write crappy stuff and they like to be bigger than they actually are. So I find, I have my teams watch very carefully. And if there are small things, I like to promote dialogue and debate. So I always respond with facts. Well, in fact, that's not the case. It actually is here, and here is the cited research, or the CEO, or the whatever. If that continues, I just hide them, <laughs> or delete them. And you, you know, it's kind of like the playground. You want to play like a bully, then you don't deserve to really play. And that's how I feel. I don't know how you guys feel, but it's sort of like good works in the world will pay off to you. But people who are snarky, but I don't, I don't believe that ever, ever, that if someone has an opinion that they don't like your product or service, that that's room for taking them off, ever. You know, it really is a marketplace. If you're going to play in that space and you're going to play in transparency, you got to have both sides. And that's what's tricky about it. Thank you all for coming. Welcome back for the afternoon part of our conference. I had the opportunity to walk around to a few, a few tables and introduce myself, and the energy that I was feeling from everyone who's here was just palpable and exciting. And I hope that of the 30 or 40 students that I talked to, I hope everybody here is having as an exciting day as they have had. From what I've heard, it's been a great morning. So let's give a round of applause to all of our speakers. Pioneer Valley is really growing with its entre entrepreneurial ecosystem, and the Grinspoon Entrepreneurship Initiative is very much at the heart of that. You've all probably met some people from Valley Venture Mentors today. They were speakers on the, on the uh, Shark Tank, and they were speakers in other sessions. They are very active with monthly meetings and training sessions, and I strongly recommend that you all think about coming and attending some of their events. It's a great group and very open and welcoming, very inclusive. They're about to launch the first local accelerator competition that you'll be hearing about probably in the next few weeks. 
And, and like I said, they would love to have students attend their monthly meetings. I also hear that there may be an innovation cafe opening in downtown Springfield sometime in the near future. So there's a lot going on in downtown Springfield. Before we go to hear our keynote speaker, I want to introduce you to a few important people. In addition to the faculty members who I introduced you to this morning, also representing us here today is a few members of our Grinspoon Entrepreneurship Advisory Committee. They're the ones that review the Spirit Award nominations that I talked about this morning, and they are the ones that make the final decisions on who gets the different awards. So here with us today, and please hold your applause until I read through everyone, we have Adrian Bailey Dion, who's our Chief Operating Officer at the Foundation, Diane Doherty, Diane is the director, the regional director of the Mass Small Business Development Center, Western Mass Regional Office. Dr. Linda Peters is uh, the founding director of this initiative and a professor at the Eisenberg School of Management at UMass. And Dean Eric Guven, who is the dean of the law school at Western New England University. So thank you all for the great work that you do. And last, but not least, you heard me this morning talk about the man we have to thank for bringing us here today together to advance entrepreneurship education here in the Pioneer Valley, the very generous Mr. Harold Grinspoon. I would like to introduce to you Jay Leonard, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Jay Leonard is an economic researcher at Babson Capital, and in his spare time, he is the new co-head for the Springfield Venture Fund and is a board member for Valley Venture Mentors. Get to know Jay. He is a huge advocate for entrepreneurship in our region. Jay? Thank you, Carrie. A lot of people here. Uh, just uh, for my own sake, and I, I think the number is going to be reasonably small, but I suspect it will be bigger in years to come. How many of you have ever been to a Valley Venture Mentors meeting? That's a pretty good sized number. It will be bigger next year. You guys should come second Wednesday of the month, 5 p.m. over at Tower Square. It's a lot of fun. You can find us on Eventbrite, valleyventurementors.org. So, um, Parker Holcomb is a good friend of mine and uh, Carrie asked me to introduce him today. It's easy to find easy things, easy to find nice things to say about Parker. Um, one of the funny things about Parker though is he's still writing his speech. <laughs> and he'll tell me when he's done so I may talk for a very, very long time. Um, so uh, Parker's from Texas. He went to uh, Amherst College and he started uh, All College Storage, which is uh, the uh, largest entity that he is uh, in charge of running. And uh, while he was a student there, and uh, he's still running it today, he graduated in 2011. He uh, participated in Valley Venture Mentors and in the Grinspoon program. Uh, I think the, the most remarkable thing to me about Parker is how hard he works. Um, and uh, you don't really get that because he seems like a pretty chill dude. Uh, and, uh, but he really busts his ass and he works really, really hard at understanding the things that have to be right about what his business is. He didn't know nearly any of the things he needed to know to make his business work, but he committed himself to figure it out, found the people that he needed to find, and got it done. Um, I had, uh, I've had many great mentors in my life, uh, and one of the things that they've told me over and over and over again is if you want the things that we have, you do the things that we do. And uh, we could all do well by following Parker's example. Parker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jay, for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Harold and the uh, Grinspoon uh, Entrepreneurship Initiative for uh, inviting me to speak here. 
Um, I've been in, uh, involved with the, uh, the initiative for, for several years since I was, uh, was at Amherst, and it's, uh, it's a great honor to be, to be invited to, uh, to come up here and, and speak and, uh, and give my two cents. So uh, Jay got some of that right, and uh, I have indeed been uh, working full-time as a, an entrepreneur since my graduation in, uh, in 2011. Um, so being your own boss is great. Uh, creating, uh, making happy customers, uh, making money, uh, and being your own boss is uh, incredible. But it pale, pales in comparison uh, to one of the greatest benefits of uh, entrepreneurship, which is the ability to constantly learn, uh, the constant uh, ability uh, to discover, to grasp, hone new skills. Uh, the experience has been incredibly uh, rewarding. Uh, but it's not all sunshine and kitten videos. Um, entrepreneurship can be hard, uh, it can be lonely, it can be uh, difficult decisions. Uh, so there are plenty of definitions uh, that I've heard of, uh, of an entrepreneur uh, over the past several years, uh, but one of my favorite ones that's uh, rang the most true to me is an entrepreneur is somebody who jumps off a cliff and figures out how to build a plane on the way down. <laughs> Both parts can be incredibly difficult, and I'm still trying to figure out how to build a plane, uh, but I want to share a few things that I've learned while jumping off cliffs with you. So first and foremost, entrepreneurship is hard. If entrepreneurship wasn't supposed to be hard, they wouldn't have made it so darn hard to spell. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and there might not be anything that illustrates how hard entrepreneurship is uh, more so than getting started, jumping off that cliff. It takes a certain level of confidence, it takes a certain level of craziness, and a whole lot of hard work. If there's one thing I can say about entrepreneurs that I've met in the past seven years, it's that we're all a little bit neurotic. Yes, uh, there's some problem that we're all so anal about, so bothered by, uh, that we had to dedicate our lives to solving. So what drives me nuts? Well, namely, it's large, aimless groups of people trying to get things done. Uh, one example of something that grinds my gears is a group of guys standing around trying to coordinate a pickup basketball game. I mean, it's just so straightforward to me. I mean, let's just get it together, take shots, get in line, uh, get it started. I mean, efficiency people, uh, efficiency, right? Um, so the bad news is that uh, being this type A doesn't always make you friends at the uh, gym, uh, but it might uh, help you. <laughs> but it might help you come up with uh, business ideas that you uh, that you might want to solve. So, for example, uh, there was this one time I started a storage company. Um, and uh, as uh, Jay said, I'm from, uh, from Texas, and I went off to boarding school in, uh, in Connecticut for a year. Uh, my parents were still home in, uh, in Dallas. Uh, I had since gotten into Amherst College and knew I was coming up here uh, after the end of the summer, but certainly wasn't gonna take my mini fridge back home to Texas or any of my winter clothes. Um, so we took this route uh, and pulled a favor with a friend who lived in Syracuse. That's right, we drove eight hours out of the way uh, in order to drop my stuff in a friend's garage. Um, so a year later, uh, when I was at the end of my freshman year at Amherst, uh, I knew that there had to be a wetter, better way, or at least you know, I figured that there was. Um, so I looked into it and uh, took the initiative of coordinating amongst my group of friends. Um, so yes, there were some options out there on what to do with my, uh, my stuff other than drive them over to Syracuse, New York, but I thought they were nauseatingly inefficient uh, as well. Uh, they took uh, such ridiculous ideas as calling somebody, printing out a piece of paper, mailing in a check. Uh, I mean, I didn't even know where a stamp goes, but apparently it goes there. So. Uh, <laughs> During my search, I met a local storage facility owner with excess capacity. Uh, we both knew that we could run a more efficient operation. Uh, one thing led to another, and uh, the summer after my freshman year, all college, or five college storage, uh, it's now become all college storage, was born. So by the start of sophomore year, 5CS uh, had now grown into a four-way partnership. Gabe, Zach, Parker, and local business guy. Later on in the story, a local business guy ends up being involved in some legal activity that ends, us, uh, ends up with us having the police and the courts involved, so we're just going to leave him as local business guy. <laughs> uh, throughout sophomore year, we did what was necessary to establish a business. We didn't always know what that was, but we did whatever was necessary. I knew I needed a, a simple website and a paperless operation. 
Now, I'd always been a verified tech snob. Uh, this had happened ever since my dad handed down his Palm Pilot to me in third grade. Uh, but I didn't actually know how to code. I didn't know how to make an actual website myself. Uh, but I knew I'd figure it. Uh, I knew I'd figure it out. And through meeting a, a local web developer, we had our simple website. Gross. No pictures, uh, just text. I'm not sure why ever, anyone ever entered a credit card into that, um, but it works. So what arose out of this first year was a simple but functional and paper-free website, uh, pricing model, advertising and operational experience, a few thousand dollars, and a heck of a lot of enthusiasm. We were rearing to go for another season. We knew we could offer this service beyond the five college area. Uh, the problem was that the opportunity was a full 11 months away. Uh, but we were hooked on the business and we couldn't wait to get back at it. So post sophomore summer, we just decided to start another business and we started a laundry company. Uh, so we followed a similar, similar formula, built a website, got administrators on, bar, on board, marketed the services and got customers signed up. Then all we had to do was the pick up, wash, dry, fold and operations all year round. With a week to go before the service started, we had already made over $10,000 in sales and felt like we knew how to do it all. All with the big giant exception of we had zero idea how to do any laundry. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, we had a service starting the following week. We had taken $10,000 from our peers and we had no idea how to process the laundry. But again, we weren't worried about it. We figured it out. We never had any doubt. Uh, just do it, as a uh, certain shoe entrepreneur, Phil Knight, would say. So this has been a, certainly a guiding principle of entre uh, entrepreneurship. You don't know how to solve the problems in front of you. You have no idea what problems lay on the horizon. And you, but you have the personal confidence that between you and the people around you, you'll be able to figure it out. All right. So getting started, entrepreneurship is hard. Another part, commit. Decisions are hard. So there's really no better time to start a business than while you're in college. You have access to an incredible amount of resources and opportunities from faculty and staff eager, eager to help to potential co-founder classmates to, you know, per se, a entrepreneurship conference on a random Friday. But like everything else, being a college entrepreneur has an expiration date, uh, expiration date on it. Uh, I was exactly at this crossroads, a situation all of you are about to have on the horizon. Uh, what are you going to do after graduation? Long before I ever started a storage company, I thought the perfect idea would to be uh, go into management consulting. I'm not sure exactly why I uh, knew that I wanted to be a management consultant, other than it would provide a certain level of prestige and paycheck that I thought would be an appropriate next step after college. So during my senior fall, I did everything necessary to prepare for that interview. I spent countless hours preparing for the case interview portion by reading prep books, I exchanged mock interviews with my uh, roommates, and I studied mental math at any uh, possible chance. All this preparation led me to a final round interview at Bain Capital headquarters in Boston. I thought I had been prepared for any question that they would ask about a case interview or any resume uh, thoughts that they would have. Uh, but it was actually a question that I asked one of the interviewers that uh, kind of rocked my world. So one of my interviewers, her name was Lisa, had what seemingly the perfect resume. She had gone to Brown undergrad, then on to Bain, then on to Harvard Business School, and then back to Bain as an associate. Uh, so I'm big on advice, and I knew that I had to ask her uh, what her thought process was as she was graduating college. And what she said back to me really rang true. She said to me that, well, I've always wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but the longer I'm here, the less likely that, that becomes. The longer I'm here, the less likely that becomes. So Lisa had only done my case interview. She was unaware of the businesses that I had already started and that I was wrestling this, uh, with the decision of trying to go down the entrepreneurial route um, or go on a more traditional path like uh, consulting or uh, finance like so many of my peers were. Um, the decision could not have been more difficult. Uh, all college had produced some incredible learning experiences and momentum, but at that time it's not like we were pr producing uh, finance level profits. Um, and I really thought that I could leverage that business experience from all college plus my co pending college degree into that well-paid prestigious job that I'd always dreamed about. 
So throughout the decision making process, uh, I did the best to get the advice of my friends, family, mentors. Um, and so let me take a moment to say that there's nothing more important than surrounding yourself with genuine friends and mentors. These individuals uh, are people that you can look up to, that you can aspire to emulate, individuals you can trust. Trust not only because of their business advice, uh, but trust that they have your best interests at heart. Through their shared experiences, mentors can provide anything from a new perspective to a new connection. No one succeeds in business by going at it alone. And while failure is certainly uh, be the best uh, teacher, uh, it's sometimes great to learn from other people's mistakes as well. I've had been very lucky to have some great mentors throughout my years, many of whom are sitting here in this room tonight or today. Um, but back to graduation. So I did my best to take in all of that advice from all these different mentors um, and transform it into a uh, clear path on which I was going to go. I realized that was a pretty big you know, fool's errand. Um, the road is long uh, and there's no way that you're going to know what you're going to be doing at 45 by what you're doing at 25. But given all that uncertainty, the most important thing is to keep learning, to keep building up your human capital. So uh, one of my favorite mentors is a guy, Abe Lincoln, uh, you might have heard of. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from Abe Lincoln is, give me six hours to cut down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the act. So I knew that by going through with all college, uh, or as I was considering this, I had known that it had given me the opportunity to explore hands-on way more things that I would get in a management consulting role or anything else that was a, a clear path and a desk job. All college had given me exposure to things like sales and marketing, lawsuits, logistics, web development, design. Again, there's no better way to do, uh, learn something than by doing. And considering I was the only full-time employee at the time, I was certainly doing a whole lot of doing. So I decided to jump off the, jump off the cliff, continue full-time, and continue to sharpen the ax. Now, I have to admit that this would be a way better story if I had actually got offered the job at Bain and turned it down to pursue my entrepreneurial dreams. But hey, it doesn't always work out as planned. So, you got to continue to sharpen the ax. So stay sharp. By spring of 2013, I had been out for uh, a couple of years, and by a lot of me uh, measures, my entrepreneurial road uh, was going well. All College Laundry had passed six figures in revenue. All College Storage had grown to 23 campuses across five states. Uh, and my iPhone app, uh, eHighlighter, had just been featured by my all-time favorite company and product, Evernote. So. Just a show of hands, how many of you guys are familiar with Evernote? Okay, if you're not, this is, uh, I don't work for them, I've never been paid a dollar, but uh, <laughs> I have to give them a plug that it is one of the most transformational products that I've experienced in the last five years. Uh, it's an opportunity to upload your short-term memory to the cloud and worry about all these other ideas. Uh, and not only is the product great, I really think that their company and their founder has a, uh, has a great message. When I launched eHighlighter, uh, it was far from a, a cakewalk. Uh, when I first envisioned the ideas only a few months after, uh, after college, I had no idea how to push a line of production code. Now, I had had experience uh, with designing products and managing development teams and firms through several iterations of the all college websites and, and applications, uh, but eHighlighter was a tool with a uh, way level higher of technical complexity. Uh, the idea behind eHighlighter was um, or still is, uh, that you're able to take Kindle style highlights um, but while you're reading out of a paper book. So it allows you to snap a picture of the, uh, of the page with your iPhone and then you can select a specific sentence or paragraph and that will be transcribed um, into something that's then searchable, sortable, exportable into Evernote or to your email. You can review it online as well. Uh, the idea there was, again, trying to be efficient. Uh, if you snap the picture and uh, just place the markers, you can have that sentence transcribed in you know, five or ten seconds, as opposed to having to write it down, type it out to a, a, a notebook, and then put it into your research paper later. So I had this idea, and I needed to find a way to get it done, as I had before. Uh, after exploring every uh, way short of uh, learning to code at the time, I ended up having the first uh, version developed by an offshore group of uh, developers in Bangalore. 
After six intense, largely nocturnal months of managing a group of non-English speakers halfway around the globe, uh, we launched eHighlighter for back to school in 2012. While they had accomplished some impressive technical tasks, I knew that relying on offshore contract developers was not a sustainable path. If something went wrong at 3 p.m., the only thing I could do is fire off a series of emails and pray for a response. To say that I got in over my head, technically speaking, uh, is a huge understatement. I thought I could solve some of these uh, technical problems uh, or these technical shortcomings by hiring a full-time local developer named Peter. Uh, we were going to work on the product and take it uh, on new iterations. But I quickly learned that I was in really no place to be a chief executive uh, lead from the front when that developer started to rant, run into his own problems. My previous experience of working with a storage business and knowing the most efficient way to route a truck uh, did, not, uh, did not apply here. So things did not work out with Peter. Peter disappeared after about three months. Uh, I gave him a laptop to work on it. He never returned that laptop. Uh, that sucked. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the worst things is I had a product that was uh, put out there that a lot of people liked. Um, Evernote had, uh, you know, my favorite Evernote had just promised us, a, a, or had just featured us as a uh, promoted app. Um, but I still knew there were several features that had to be changed, and I had no idea how to make those changes myself. So at that point, uh, eHighlighter got moved a little bit to the back burner. Uh, the story picks up about six months later when, fortuitously, I got to meet Phil Libin um, at the end of a keynote, and he invited me to get lunch after I pitched or stalked him uh, for a while. Uh, our hour-long conversation uh, could basically be summed up in a few uh, memorable lines. Um, how many more times are you going to walk into the room and say, I'm not the tech guy? The world is programmed. If you want to change the world, you need to know how the world works. Phil's suggestion was that I use the products and businesses that I had already had in front of me and spend the next few years or however long of my life and learn how to code. Uh, that conversation was about 18 months ago and I've took every word to heart uh, since then. Learning to code uh, like starting a business has been an extremely difficult, frustrating, and all the time uh, rewarding process. I started working on eHighlighter in uh, Xcode by working with a, a partner who I would pair program with once a week. He would come over to my apartment and he would lead the development. The first time I had no idea what he was doing, second time no idea, third idea no idea, fourth time not really an idea, fifth time uh, it kind of looked familiar. Um, and then I do remember this one specific time where we spent probably eight hours together um, and everything kind of looked familiar by then. Uh, he went on, uh, he left, and I just kept going for, you know, till five o'clock in the morning or something like that. It was the smallest amount of changes, it wasn't anything significant, but I was able to then change a button color, change the position, fix a typo, and push that change to the App Store. I was finally in the uh, you know, master of my own destiny. I wasn't beholden to calling people throughout the middle of the night um, or begging people to, to come help me. So eHighlighter was an extremely, like I said, technically complex project. Um, and I was not the engineer uh, that I needed to be in order to contribute to that product. Um, I also knew that I needed to learn a language and start a project from the bottom up. I'd come in, I'd tinkered around, I'd uh, made some changes, and that was a, a great feeling. Um, but like I talked about with ownership before, uh, it really is incredible to be able to start something from the beginning and have something to show for it at the end of the day. So I knew I had two other projects, all college storage and all college laundry, uh, to be able to work on, uh, on that implementation. So all college storage, uh, starting this past uh, January, I started working on this 80% uh, of my time along with uh, somebody to, to help me out. We uh, started from, from nothing and moved it all the way through a product that ended up supporting my business operations um, this past summer. Uh, it supported it so well that uh, we were able to implement features and tools and um, customer service requests that we were never able to access before. Um, primarily, it was just incredible to be able to know that people were using something that I had actually built. After that, uh, 
I went on to build my first project this past summer, uh, which maybe was a little more uh, simple, but was the laundry uh, site and uh, was the first site that I had built, um, you know, top to bottom um, myself. Jumping off the cliff, getting started, um, it's all an extremely educational uh, experience. Um, you learn from your failures. Uh, you try to pick up your, your advice from, uh, from uh, your mentors, but it's all an extremely personal uh, decision. Uh, you got to get started. You have to uh, be the master of your own destiny. So my favorite quote, and uh, a couple of my mentors and friends were arguing over whether to end with a cheesy quote, uh, but I really do try to live by this. I have it written on my whiteboard. I read it every day. Um, and it's by uh, a Greek philosopher named Epictetus. Um, and the quote is, uh, first say to yourself what you would be, then do what you have to do. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's going to be mics going around. Um, would be happy to answer, uh, happy to answer anything. <laughs> I'm not sure that's how time works, but okay. Yeah, I just, the, the question is, do you need partners? The full story is we used to offer the service in Mount Holyoke, um, and there was an administrative environment there that, uh, that wasn't um, ready for that at the, uh, at the time. That being said, when I started the laundry business at, uh, at Amherst, um, we came up with, you know, similarly had the experience of using a, a service like, like ours. Um, in both boarding school and, uh, and at home. And the administrator said, no, we're not really interested in something like that. Um, and I was at home in Texas at the time, and I talked to the dean of res life over the phone. Um, and he said, no, you know, we've had that pitch before, but we're not really interested. So then I pitched it to my class dean instead. Um, and they said, no, you need to go talk to this administrator. So uh, I was getting fed up. We knew we could do this and pull it off, um, but no one, was, uh, no one was listening to me. So I flew up from Texas uh, to Amherst in the middle of my sophomore year to try to meet with you know, one of these deans. Um, they yet again pushed me off, um, and uh, I just kept going over their head until they uh, finally um, got to a point where we got evaluated as a risk, uh, a risk uh, by the risk management team. We had already built the website. And then the story about you know, having 10 grand in sales, the full story is we, uh, we weren't allowed to operate and we got the okay like literally the day before students signed up. Um, but we had gone ahead and taken the sales anyways because again, we figured we'd know how to do it. So uh, I would say don't, you know, don't give up. I'm happy to talk to you if you do want to work together. Um, but uh, you know, that's my experience at Mount Holyoke. Um, so that's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so over the past year, uh, since we started to, or I started to learn how to code, um, or backing up, I guess I didn't include this, probably should have. Um, I really was finishing my presentation a couple minutes ago. Um, but we went from seven schools to 14, uh, 14 to 23 schools in my first couple years after. And then we took a pause and really saw it, like I had pushed myself to the, to the limits of, uh, of expansion. Um, and operations had been real, real tough um, two years ago. Um, and so I had taken a step back and wanted to work on this, uh, this platform, um, able to do everything from customer signups uh, to scheduling to text message integration to online billing to uh, staff accounts to signups to you know, a way to really holistically run everything. Um, and this past year, we stayed at 23 schools, but things went so much more smoothly from this technology platform that uh, I had built. Uh, that really gave us the, the confidence um, to uh, consider uh, expanding or going back on that route. So you're actually sitting at the table with, uh, with Gabe, who's uh, my, uh, my first full-time team member. 
um, and we're on the uh, on the path of expanding the, this core business of, uh, of the college storage uh, market. Um, we're also looking at uh, taking this platform, and I've had expressed interest from storage and moving companies of uh, having that implemented into their business process. Um, and so we're looking at potentially taking this software and uh, making it uh, into a white label or a licensable or a SaaS service that we can then sell you know, year round to different businesses. How do I go about marketing um, in every single you know way possible, right? So uh, it, it, you know the colleges um, they'll have different again uh, you know regulative environments. Um, I would say that the general philosophy would be to ask. Uh, well, this is being recorded, but um, ask forgiveness and not permission, right? Uh, there's uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of ways. Um, to you know, try to implement or try to talk to uh, you know, try to talk to students, and your competitors will do it if you don't. Um, so literally in any way that you possibly can, flyers, posters, marketing, Facebook, emails, um, you know, events in the uh, you know, events in the dorms, events in the dining hall, uh, items on the you know, dining hall, uh, chalk, um, you know, videos, literally anything you possibly uh, you possibly can do. Um, to get uh, the attention of, of one individual. So one, one um, way that we really thought about marketing um, was I had w one of those original partners, Gabe, uh, worked on a campaign. And he had this philosophy uh, that you had to, or his campaign had a philosophy, you had to be able to touch a customer or reach a customer seven times or five times before they were ever going to consider uh, voting for you. Um, and so I've really uh, kind of thought about that philosophy my, myself as well. So, you know, let's take a, for an example, at a school like, you know, Amherst, we have 2,000 kids there and maybe a thousand of them are our potential market, right? But in order to reach those thousand kids five times, we have to try to reach the 2,000 kids five times as well. So, you know, 10,000 total impressions. At a school where it's bigger and your market, target market's less defined, like UMass, um, you know, maybe there's 20,000 kids and uh, only 2,000, uh, you know, 2,000 um, potential students. But so to reach those 2,000 um, five times, uh, you have to market to the entire entire base uh, or get uh, 100,000 impressions, uh, you know, all over campus. So it's you know a grind. It's getting people's attention and you know in an ADD universe and just do anything you possibly can think of. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for everything today, but. Um, you talked to us a little bit about how um, you learn a lot from failing as an entrepreneur, and I was curious what you would consider one of your biggest failures and what was one of the biggest lessons you took away. Um, so I would say one of my the the biggest one of the biggest failures was that hiring of a. Uh, CTO or co-founder or um, you know technical person um, coming out of the offshore experience. So it's really really difficult and uh, to make. Um, or to identify a technical co-founder, you know anyone who's interested in tech startups or, or the the kind of world, you know, hears all the time about searching for a tech co-founder. So I had un been un unable to do that, and uh, you know, in order to differentiate myself from the crowd and everyone else who had you know an app idea and uh, you know some screenshots, I went offshore and had this built out in uh, in India. Um, but in order to uh, work on a product, in order to make it a real startup, a real product, you have to be able to iterate on ideas. You put the product out there. As soon as it goes from you know five people using it to you know our first weekend, we had five thousand people download it. Um, you know we just there were all these edge cases that we just straight missed. And so I needed that you know technical co-founder, or I needed that person to onboard to iterate, respond to those ideas. Um, and I hired this guy, uh, this guy Peter. Um, at the time, he had all the enthusiasm. He had some tech background. I had a, a technical uh, advisor interview him for me, um, but uh, he just didn't have what what it took. And I just figured, since he had the background, he had the enthusiasm, we worked well together, that he was doing it well. But I wasn't checking. I didn't know about Git, or I didn't know about how to actually look at the code base. And so I just kind of trusted that he was continuing on the path. Um, and as he was becoming increasingly frustrated, I didn't know how to, to really respond to that, because I thought he was just working hard. And I didn't realize that he just wasn't doing anything. Um, so I was literally out of the country um, the first time that he started not responding to me. Um, and 
you know, tried to call him two, three, four, five times. Uh, when I realized he unfriended me on Facebook, I realized we had a problem. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, and, and you know, it kind of progressed from there. You know, I bought a company laptop. Uh, he didn't return that. So um, I got in over my head. I, I really uh, did not know uh, how to lead that individual properly. Um, but I, I tried to, to present myself that I, I did, um, and you know I, I think I, I've you know tried to share what I take, took taken away from that is you know in order to be able to lead from the front, in order to be able to say hey we should use this technical strategy or we're going to build out this product, uh, you need to know a little bit what you're talking about. The question was where did I get the funding? Uh, so the storage business had been entirely bootstrapped. Uh, when we were in college, all we needed to take out was you know two or three thousand dollars a year to you know feel college rich, um, and we were able to you know roll all that money back into uh, back into the business. So from you know freshman year through senior, we were rolling it all back into the business, um, starting the next company, going to the next schools. So by my senior year, we were at seven schools in three states with uh, storage business and the laundry business. Um, and then it just kind of kind of rolled from there. So I just want to say first, thank you so much for sharing the real authentic story of the entrepreneurial process of all the missteps and the, you know, the non-linear nature of it. So it takes a particular amount of courage <laughs> to share that too. So yeah, my, my pleasure. Um, so my question is, you've talked about um, having this spirit or the sense, this ability to kind of jump off the cliff because mm -hmm. you don't know, you don't have it all figured out, to um, kind of take action and not ask permit, you know, ask permission or forgiveness later. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't have that, mm -hmm. what do you recommend in terms of developing a practice? Um, I mean, that, wow, that's it's, it's like this essence, right? But how do you, if you don't have that? Are there things that people can do to develop that? I mean. Wow, the, the previous questions were, were butterball. I don't have uh, I don't have a, an excellent answer to that other than you know just try to, to do it in in any increment that feels appropriate to you. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a big funded startup where you you know risk your mortgage and um, you know your 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 all of your life savings in order to, to throw down on a business. Um, you know. It could be a, as small as you know starting a, a local um, you know T-shirt production shop, right? And anywhere in between. So uh, you certainly have to you know assess your or assess your, your personal risk tolerance um, and, and go from there. But uh, you know I'm to be honest, kind of BSing through this one because I just don't have that 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 sensibility in my body. So um, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, guys. so much. I've known Parker for a few years and I'm just amazed at how relentless and resourceful he is. He just leaves no stone unturned and does not take no for an answer. So thank you, Parker.